I want to make a much needed correction. In our video, Why Cosmic Horror is Hard to Make, I made a statement that I don't agree with anymore. Thankfully, it's not about the content of the essay. I still believe trying to represent the cosmic horror genre in a visual medium is a difficult task. And to our flattering surprise, many people agreed with us, or at least it sparked a lot of people's curiosity. So what I want to correct is this statement regarding existential dread. Existential dread is an emotion that is difficult to explain. It's a feeling that we rarely experience in comparison to happiness, fear, or anger. Well, a quick succession of world-changing events later, and I'm proven to be wrong. I've noticed that not only is existential dread more recurring, but I now recognize I've felt its overpowering force many times in the past without realizing it. Being faced with these feelings, I find myself going back to the cosmic horror genre to continue to explore how to better portray it cinematically. Habitually, cosmic horror is represented as the juxtaposition of a human coming to terms with something greater, terrifying, and often indifferent about humanity to the degree that it can mentally overpower you and make you go insane. For today's video, I want to move the focus away from how to represent the visual complexity of the unimaginable monstrosities of the genre, and instead, focus on the important perspective that is often overlooked and perhaps easier to grasp. In other, simpler words, don't think about how to represent the monster. Think of how to represent the person facing the monster. I believe there is still much to learn on how to show the effects of someone coming face to face with something completely beyond them. But of course, the problem of doing so is again, how do you show such a personal and hard to verbalize, internally daunting emotion? I think the key to understanding this is by unpacking this feeling in the man that helped grow the genre. If the monsters we create are symptoms of our fears, then let's dive into Lovecraft's fears to better understand how to show this feeling that at times seems cosmically unattainable, but its origins could actually be quite grounded. Let's begin by taking a slightly scenic route into H.P. Lovecraft's early life to better understand how he saw the world and the origins of this man's fears. Howard Phillips Lovecraft was born at the tail end of the 19th century in Providence, Rhode Island, to a well-to-do family that could trace its lineage to the first New England colonies. While he was still very young, his father was institutionalized and died of syphilis. His mother was overprotective of him after her husband's death, but didn't show much affection towards her only son, even belittling him often regarding his physical appearance. H.P. Lovecraft was very smart and learned to read and write early on. His maternal grandfather fostered the boy's love of reading and even introduced him to gothic horror. They all lived at his grandfather's family home. Eventually, their initial monetary largesse was thinning, and once Lovecraft's grandfather died, he and his mother had to move away because a house upkeep would be too expensive. I mention this because it kicked off one of H.P. Lovecraft's darkest periods. He had even contemplated committing suicide when his grandfather died. Without going further into his background, we can already see many elements that could seriously impact any person's mental health. Some aspects we know from his letters, others we can infer on. But one thing is for sure, Lovecraft didn't have it easy, and it affected the way he saw the world. Imagine being in his shoes, being told that you're ugly and weak by the person who is supposed to love you unconditionally, and growing up with that complex. Being sick and separated from others your age, and even though you're smart and adapt, you've missed out on so much. Although it's not known if his mother ever told him, potentially knowing that your father was committed because he went mad, and developing a phobia around the possibility of having a mental illness, losing the one person who understood you and encouraged you, and then isolating yourself from the world, mixing your limited sheltered life experiences with what you read and what you've heard. Lovecraft was a product of the era he lived in. His context, his love for the days of the past, the 18th century, and his stunted growth might help explain why he was such a xenophobe. Yes, by the end of his life, his views had softened, but for a long time, he held very racist beliefs. His fears influenced his beliefs, and it defined the way he saw the world, and it seeped into his writing. His bleak outlook on life, his fear of the other while residing in an evolving world, the fear of going mad, they very much could be represented by the many indifferent horrors he created, and in the ways his characters reacted to being faced with such horrors. H.P. Lovecraft had a very specific way of writing, a Baroque style closer to the King James Bible than to anything else written in the early 1900s. Just listen to this passage from The Shadow Over Innsmouth. I seemed to know that its seething mutations invited me down impious vistas beset with foul legions of the malignant and the blasphemous. 
to realms where the moon was a sinister ellipsoid, sucked wantonly from space, at the throbbing of bass drums behind the arrows of madness, I seem to know also where the old ones broke through of old, and where they shall break through again. A lot of what Lovecraft wrote is about mood, ambiance, the psychology of someone coming face to face with something terrifying. There's vivid imagery, a palpable sense of unease, the sense of impending horror. Having looked at Lovecraft's upbringing, it wouldn't be a stretch to believe that he might have suffered from some type of anxiety disorder, which would explain why he had such a handle on describing a character's dread. That sense that harm is imminent and inescapable. The fight or flight response enacted by an invisible stimulus. It's very similar to what a person can experience during an anxiety or panic attack. If you've ever had one, you know it's nothing pleasant. Even the term panic attack feels like it minimizes the ordeal. There's a sense of being overwhelmed by everything around you. Sounds, lights, people, smells. Your senses betray you, maybe because of an irrational fear, all exacerbated by the mounting anxiety that leads you to feel disoriented, like you might be losing your grip, not only on reality, but on life. You feel like you're dying. Your brain might initially try to convince you that you're not. But the heart palpitations, the hyperventilation, the difficulty breathing, the dizziness, the weakness and numbness in your extremities, and even chest pain, they tell you otherwise. If there's a parallel to be made with anxiety and the portrayal of cosmic horror, then I believe understanding how to represent cosmic dread in a character lies in how we normally react when facing an overpowering and overwhelming unknown. As we've mentioned before, translating the psychological aspect of cosmic horror onto the screen is not easy. Barring the use of voiceover to narrate what a character is going through, or what the ambiance is, most of the storytelling has to come from non-verbal performances, or visuals, or even sounds. We'd like to take a look at certain scenes that make us relate to characters as they replicate some of that sensation of being overwhelmed. Although the scenes might not come from movies or shows that are considered to be cosmic horror, they are good examples to follow on how to communicate personal mounting dread. Let's start off with a simple one. I've always liked the scene in Independence Day when the alien vessels arrive. Before we even glimpse the ships, we see their shadows blanketing the landscape. People's beliefs and worldviews are being shattered by the visual confirmation that there is life outside of our solar system and it's at our doorstep. Some freeze, forsaking personal safety, some panic, some run, chaos is everywhere. Here the sense of dread or impending doom is caused by scale. The weight and significance of your powerlessness is visually evident. You and everything around you is confirmed to be as important as an ant. The film Gravity also plays with scale by showing us the dangerous realities of space within the first few minutes. Pieces of debris are flying towards the explorer's crew. The lack of sound from the numerous impacts, the frenzied communications between the astronauts and mission control, the continuous, uninterrupted and dizzying camera movement around the scene, they all serve to put us in the protagonist's headspace as she is hurtled away into the void of space. By how increasingly small she's getting, the more you have a better understanding of how terrified she is. The Battle of the Bastards from Game of Thrones is a great example on how to edit someone being overwhelmed in a suffocating fight. The frenzied way his struggle is filmed, with extreme, almost indiscernible close-ups, and audio increasingly becoming more and more muffled, the near silence signaling an inability to breathe, until he manages to squeeze out and take in air with a loud gasp. But there is a scene that in contrast doesn't need to be extremely dynamic to capture an overwhelming sense of dread. Just look at this small moment in Chernobyl, when one of the scientists is forced to look into the recently erupted nuclear reactor. The camera pans out as he marches reluctantly. Then it pushes in, keeping his reaction from us. You would expect a look of horror or signs of a breakdown, but his reaction is even more minute. A calm but devastating look of complete surrender to an invisible threat that has already sealed his fate. 
An example that uses mainly light and an actor's reaction can be found at the end of the lighthouse. The younger Thomas climbs the steps to come face to face with the light. When he reaches out to touch it, the light's brightness grows, erasing the black streaks of blood on his face. We don't get to see what he sees, we are only witness to his entranced expression. The eerie music gets louder and distorted by Thomas's screams that started off out of ecstasy but are now full of pain and horror. The power of what he has seen and experienced makes him fall down the stairs and eventually he's left bloody, naked and blind to be pecked apart by the birds. But I think my favorite example of being overwhelmed by an overpowering force is in 2001 A Space Odyssey. When the monolith reaches Jupiter, there is already a sense of foreboding due to the primal chorus in the soundtrack. Once the planets align, Dave is sent through the Stargate, and we are bombarded not only by the ominous music, but the visuals. The kaleidoscopic colors and shapes lead us to imagine that Dave's senses are being overstimulated by things that are beyond his mortal human grasp, and that all his mind can make out are colorful shapes at their most basic level. The dizzying array of visuals is intermingled with still frames of a very distraught Dave giving us the impression that so much is being experienced and absorbed in one fraction of a nanosecond that it's a wonder his brain doesn't explode. The vistas are that of another galaxy, another world. Landscapes familiar to ours, but different. And Dave's eyes remain open throughout, showing us that he's maintained consciousness during the voyage, but it has changed him. When we see his full face again, inside the pod that has landed in his new home, Dave has the Kubrick stare, hinting that madness is not far behind. So there can be many effective ways of portraying a character facing an overwhelming force, but I think the simplest thing to keep in mind is this. As H.P. Lovecraft put it, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. For Lovecraft, the unknown could have been familial relationships, people in general, or the possibility of mental illness waiting for him around the corner. Not only did it spawn personal anxiety, but vague, unimaginable monstrosities. But what is it for you? What does the overpowering unknown look like to you? And how does it make you feel? Start there. Use it.